new king of story has ascended his throne. The Lakers are 0-3 for the first time in 34 years. There's a lot of long looks in Lakerland wondering, when is this going to get better? Well, it's going to be a little edgy here you know, because I mean, I'm not very happy camper walking around here right now. And, um, you know, some things we got to show up. And uh, we've got to make sure we keep a sense of urgency. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of The Scoop. I'm your host, Sean Harris. Let's start with the NBA. After losing to the crosstown rival, the Clippers, 105-95 the other night, the Lakers find themselves somewhere they haven't been since 1978. And that is 0-3 to start the regular season. Even though Kobe Bryant had a 40-point night and also passing Magic Johnson to be the all-time Lakers steals leader, the Lakers star told the fans, quote, shut up and let us work, unquote. The last time that this has happened, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Norm Nixon, and the 2012 Hall of Fame inductee Jamal Wilkes were on that team. And who was the coach then? Jerry West. Now my question to you guys is, should we panic? Or should we not panic over the 0-3 start that the Lakers has start the season off with? Especially losing to the crosstown rival, the Clippers, which is a very good team, I might add. They got a nice little squad there. But I don't think so from a personal perspective. You got to understand. There's a whole lot of basketball left to play. The season is still early. Now, when you get close to the All-Star break, of course, and the Lakers haven't seemed to balance out what they need to balance out as far as Dwight Howard, Paul Casal, Kobe Bryant, Steve Nash, and Metta World Peace, the starting five, and also the bench that they acquired is concerned, then, yeah, maybe you might want to start calling for some situations to happen or some scenarios to take place. But until then, folks, there's a lot of basketball left to play. We're going to be joined by Hugh Douglas and Jalen Rose on Numbers Never Lie, ESPN's newest hit show. Let's take it away with them. Because what's going on now? You got Mike Brown. Coach Brown is trying to implement a new offense. You're going to have some growing pains. Everybody knows that. The problem is that you have three superstars on there. You have an alpha male in Kobe Bryant who has basically stated that he's going to probably retire in two years. Mm -hmm. He wants to get it done now. He doesn't want to go through these growing pains. This is the frustration that you're hearing from him right now. You, you, this offense, Coach said that it's going to take at least to January to get everything right. Right. I don't even think it's going to be around in January. I mean, it's a tough spot to get. You look at the way that Steve Nash is playing right now. He's a non-factor on this, this Lakers team at this point. Jalen, are you with Hugh? Are you concerned now? I am not concerned. If I was a Laker fan, I would be concerned if this team can win the championship. But all along, I contend that the Oklahoma City Thunder are my favorite to win the West. The Lakers have actually played good basketball in spurts. Dwight Howard had a terrific game, too. Kobe Bryant has been efficient in both games. Pau Gasol is playing like an all-star. The main adjustment is for Steve Nash. In Phoenix, fellas, he spread the floor with four shooters, one slash five, and therefore he's able to penetrate and kick and or finish. He doesn't have the space in Los Angeles in order to be able to dribble underneath the basket and dribble out the other side. He has to get off the basketball faster. As you see, those lanes are congested. But he's a two-time MVP. He figured out they'll be okay. And that, that's, the, that's the point that I'm making. You have a guy out there who's used to distributing the basketball, and he's not getting it done right now. This offense, right, I, I, I can predict, or I'm thinking, that pretty soon they're going to start chirping about this offense and they're not going to want to run it. This is a problem. This is going to be a huge problem. This is the problem that you're having. The guys are not – they're not happy right now. They're not, they're not having fun playing basketball trying to figure it out. It doesn't look that way. It, it, and that's what you're seeing. And it, before it gets any better, it's going to get worse. They still want to figure out what they're going to do at small forward. I see them easing E-Banks in, giving them more minutes for our test. The adjustment, guys, is 
Steve Nash. He's a pick and roll point guard that used to that is used to having the basketball the entire possessions. He'll find his balance regardless of the offense, whether it's Princeton, whether it's Triangle. He's a two-time MVP. He will figure it out. Thanks to Hugh Douglas and Jalen Rose for bringing their perspectives on how they feel about the situation at hand with the Lakers starting the season off at 0-3. And thank the ESPN Network for allowing us to listen to that on Numbers Never Lie, the new hit show coming to you weekly. Now let's turn over to another story at hand in the NBA. This one here, I'm quite sure everybody's familiar with since the offseason, and that's Ray Allen and the Boston Celtics. What kind of feud boiled between the two on both sides after this scenario during the offseason where Ray Allen decided to take his talents to South Beach to join LeBron, Dwayne, and Chris. Hoisting up their championship banner, LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosh, and the crew all displaying their championship rings. Ray Allen, the former Boston Celtics, has another issue to tackle at hand. His former teammates, the backlash from the Boston Celtic teammates, saying that he was a traitor. He sold out on his team. He jumped ship to join the bandwagon, etc. You look Ray Allen up in the dictionary about all these words, his picture is boldly shown out there. But there's a side of Ray Allen that we all don't know. Amai Rashad sat down with him one-on-one to explain why he chose to go to South Beach to join LeBron, Dwayne Wade, and Chris Bosh and leave the Boston Celtics in his rearview mirror. 1,500 miles away in South Beach. Ray Allen is considered one of the game's greatest shooters following a five-year run in Boston that saw him win his first championship and become the all-time three-point king. Ray opted to join forces with the Celtics Fiercest rivals and reigning NBA champ, the Miami Heat. Didn't have to twist your arm to come down here to Miami, did I? You know, I, I live right up the street. You do? Yes, I do. Miami! Yeah. So, you gotta tell me, man, how, how did you come to this decision? To uh. leave the Celtics, went to school right in the area, had your home there, pretty much really settled down, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden, think I'm gonna go play for Miami. Man, it was, it was a tough decision, for sure. We got to the end of the season, and ironically enough, Miami put us out, you know, so I was, you know, distraught about that. And the Miami Heat for the second year in a row, Eastern Conference champions. Will Ray Allen be back in a Boston uniform, or will this be his final time wearing the Celtic green? Once the free agent process came, my wife and I, we sat there and we said, this situation we have to kind of think thoroughly. So Miami came to the table and we thought, well, we can't really go to Miami. I'm still upset that they beat us. I heard from Boston, but there was no courtship there. It was almost as if, you know, they just took me for granted and kind of let me float out there. And I was like, well, you know, maybe there isn't a future in Boston for me. So I came down to Miami and they told me everything I wanted to hear from. And it wasn't just talk. It was how they played and, you know, how they could use me in their offense and how I can affect what LeBron or D-Wade and Chris Bosh are doing. Talk about coming here. Pat Riley's got to be the probably the best recruiter in the entire NBA, I would imagine. He's one of those guys that when you talk to him, you know, he's talking about your character and wanting to be associated with people who are, are stand-up guys. And, you know, he, he talked about his relationship with LeBron and D-Wade and how they talked always about being better leaders and, you know, guys that carry the franchise on their back and always doing what's right, not only for themselves, but for the, their teammates. So I felt like he was holding everybody here accountable. You know, he was making sure that there's no one person bigger than the next. You know, we're going to win this together. And that is what's important to me. With Dwayne here, that would not appear as likely. You what? mean I'm not starting? A- ask the man to your left. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. I wish they'd told me that last week. <laughs> All right, Eric, more storylines for next year. Rondo <laughs> shuts it up. Here's Allen with a deep three. Yes! 
you are is arguably the best three-point shooter to ever play in the NBA. Now, and you come to a team, they want to see that. Yeah, let me see what you're really made of. Like, right. I, I hear what people are saying, but let me see who you are. Is it all built to, out right. of fluff, right. or is this a, there's a foundation there? Last week, me and LeBron, we had a shooting game, and I didn't win. To me, <laughs> that's what I love about it, because they're challenging me even in what I do to be better. Uh, I'm going back to the dark side. In my mind, I'm like, okay, I got to get in a little bit earlier so I can get even more warmed up. <laughs> so, you know, I can't lose these guys. That's just the competition level that's in practice that I appreciate. I have known you for a long time. I've seen you at every single level of your career. And I've never seen you as excited about a season as I see now. Sunshine does it. It definitely helps. I would say that within the last three or four years, I got to a point in my career where I really understood who I was and what I, I'm capable of doing. So it's not work. I just really know who it is that I am and what I need to do out on the floor every single day. Nice. That's it, Ray. Nice job. Also, you know, we've talked considerably, and you know, he's like, "Well, what do you think in this situation? And what would you do here in this play? And you know, how are we going to run a team?" And, you know, just being around LeBron and D-Wade, those guys have a great connection with each other. I'm seeing these guys allow me to step in and, you know, kind of help them. You know, they're just a, a bunch of guys that I appreciate being with. You know what? I came back with my sister. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> so, you open up the season against the Celtics. How weird would that be, playing against uh, your old teammates and playing against the Celtics? Well, it's extremely weird, too, because they'll be getting their rings at night. They'll be hoisting the banner. And so when you think of it like that, I'm on the other team. Yes. Yeah, because they beat us. So I'm, normally I would be watching them like, oh, we're going to get them this year. <laughs> right. It's a weird situation because I don't know emotionally how to feel about it other than I got to be happy for them because they won and, you know, they deserved it. But, you know, my focus is to win another championship. Here's Allen for three. Got it! Although Ray turned 37 in July, there have been few signs that he's slowing down. In fact, Ray made a career-high 45% of his shots from beyond the arc last season. Not bad for an old guy. And when we come back, I will be bringing up a story about an NFL football player who's going through a type of turmoil that a lot of young athletes in all sports go through today. You'll find it quite interesting to hear about what's been going on with this young man and also with the trade deadline already gone the Jets decided they was going to keep Tim Tebow after all my question is is how will Rex Ryan and the offensive line be able to use Tim Tebow to improve their 3-5 and five start to salvage their season segment of the show is brought to you by Tally's Market. Tally's Market, everything you need for parties and occasions all up under one roof. So go down there and see Happy in the Game at Tally's today. Welcome back. Turning up the page now, we're going to go to talk about something that's real serious that everyone uh, at one point or another goes through. Whether you, you know, have a good paying job or you hit the lottery or, you know, just whatever your fortune is that come into your life. You have family members that 
feel that they should be an integral part of it. And they would do anything and anything possible that they could in every way to try to get a piece of what you already have of your fortune. This story is about a Dallas offensive lineman, Tyron Smith, who is going through that same problem. Chris Mortensen reports from NFL 32. You hear about these things at the NFL Rookie Symposium every year. This is a case study for it. Tyron Smith was the ninth pick in the draft a year ago. Came into the league as a 20-year-old. Got a four-year, $12 million contract. Saturday night, he had to call 911 because he was being threatened by family members. And he has given his, this family, his family members, more than a million dollars. And he finally cut them off. And they threatened him. And now, not only is team security, who I understand has been involved for a while, but they're getting a restraining order in this case, and certainly NFL security is alerted because there was a, a threat, I'm told a significant threat here, uh, for a young man who's still only 21 years old, and he's their left tackle, heck of a player. But uh, these are stories, they're, they're nightmare stories. Now, that was a deep story um, you all just heard about Dallas Cowboys offensive lineman Tyron Smith. Let me just say this. To me, that is a shame and a travesty that this young man has to go through this. Despite, you know, he felt that he finally made it. Now he can better take care of his family. He can better take care of himself. And everybody, you know, can be happy for him that he's doing great. And he stabilized himself from a financial standpoint to be able to help those. But when they stepped over the line and did what they did to this young man that's where it becomes serious as you heard in the report and nobody should have to go through that no matter like I said no matter how you got your fortune you know the first thing that an individual want to do I know me myself is that you know I would like to you know, take care of myself, take care of my loved ones, and take care of my siblings and my mother and my father and, you know, people out there that, you know, was by my side through thick and thin, through the ups and downs when I didn't have nothing. I didn't. I don't expect for them to want to take advantage of me like that by, you know, doing what they did to this young man, but... These type of things happen, and just a reminder out there to, to those that are in situations like that or have been in situations like that, to those family members, you guys need to back up a little bit and need to step off a little bit because this is a situation that could really turn into something serious, let alone catastrophic in ways that you or anyone else could ever imagine. Trade deadline is today at 4 p.m. And Tim Tebow continues to be one of the names swirling around in the trade rumors. Question is, how many teams should or could Tebow make better? I want you to put away all your social devices and you shut your computer because I'm about to preach and I'm about to teach and I want you to listen to what I'm saying. There are five teams that should acquire the services of one Tim Tebow and I'll make it six because I wish the Jets would trade for Tim Tebow because it's like he's not even there. It is a disgrace how, how, what they have done with him and to Tim Tebow. You know it and I know it. You ready? I'm listening. Thank you. You're welcome. Jacksonville is on a silver platter for Tim Tebow to return to his home area. He grew up just outside of Jacksonville and turn around a franchise just the way he turned around the Denver Broncos and their lousy 23rd ranked defense when they were 1-4 in four last year and he won 7 of the next 8 games. Jacksonville, as we discussed previously on the show, is dead last in every offensive category. Their defense is ranked 27th and Tim Tebow returning to Jacksonville would create a nuclear media reaction. You know it, and I know it. Next on the list, the Buffalo Bills. Many thought they were a wild card team, a threat to the Patriots and to the Jets before the year, the season started. They are kidding themselves with Ryan Fitzpatrick. They have talent on the defensive side, starting with Mario Williams. Tim Tebow would turn that around in a heartbeat. The Arizona Cardinals are next. That is a wild card team waiting to happen with a top five defense that is 
only a playmaking quarterback away from getting on a wild card wrong. Next up, the Kansas City Chiefs, another team many thought would be a wild card team this year. They're kidding themselves with both of their quarterbacks, and you want to talk about redefinating that rapid fan base in Kansas City? Just send Tim Tebow there and see what suddenly happens and how that team gets suddenly transformed. And finally on my list, my fifth team that should acquire Tim Tebow, the Oakland Raiders, because Tim Tebow, good Christian that he is, he's a bad boy. <laughs> Tim Tebow. Okay. Their use of him has been an utter disgrace. Um, I'm ashamed of the Jets organization for how they've treated Tim Tebow. Because despite my proclamations about the absence of his throwing ability, he does not deserve what happened, what has happened to him in New York. With the NFL trade deadline came and gone, and Tim Tebow is still a Jet, so what's next? The Jets at 3-5 and five knows that Tebow might be their only chance to keep people in the MetLife Stadium seats for the last three home games of the season and keep what is left of their playoff hopes. You know something? I could be wrong, but I'm just going to throw that out there anyway to y'all. To me, the best way that the Jets can use Tim Tebow is they have to rid themselves of the fear of a quarterback controversy between Tebow and Sanchez and just turn the guy loose and see what he got. It don't hurt. I mean, you're on a bye week. You're coming off the bye week. Week 10 of the NFL. Your season is in jeopardy. Your fans are angry right now because you're not playing this guy. You're not giving this guy a shot. And if you are playing him, you're putting him in a situation where he's not even comfortable playing. The fans don't want to see him playing all of that. They want to see him at quarterback. So, Rex Ryan and your offensive coordinators, you guys need to understand that he pretty much is the only shot that you got left to try to do something because your season is all but done. We're going to take a commercial break. Coming up next, the WWE, I know this is something that a lot of people are not into, entertainment, sports, wrestling, but I happen to be a big fan of it for a long time. Uh, I admit it. But here, well, what they've done, it would amaze you to find out what the WWE has done. And also, we'll look into the NFL. What they've done when we return to the school. This segment of The Scoop is brought to you by Verizon Wireless, America's largest 4G network. Breast cancer doesn't care if you had other plans. All the time, all through your life. It doesn't care if you're about to get married. It doesn't care if you have a family. It doesn't care if you're a mother. A grandmother. That's a friend. Or a daughter. Breast cancer doesn't care. Cause we 
Howdy, WWE Universe. It was truly John Cena here with a very important day here at the TD Bank North Garden in Boston. The Susan G. Komen for a Cure Foundation has partnered with the WWE. And ladies and gentlemen, the WWE is so proud to join forces and partner with the Susan G. Komen for the Cure to help fight breast cancer. Big night. Thank you guys very much. The WWE is spreading awareness. The middle rope being pink. The Susan G. Komen Cure logo on our entrance ramp. The WWE very proud to be partnering with Susan G. Komen. Tonight we have some special women in the audience. All of these women are breast cancer survivors. I am wearing pink to support the Susan G. Komen for the Cure Foundation. You see I'm wearing this new pink and black ring gear to help raise funds and awareness for the fight against breast cancer. Get the gear. Join the fight. Well, not only a good way to promote the message of awareness, but a great way to raise money for the charity at the same time. 99.9 .9 of us have a, a story or some sort of relationship with, with this disease. About 20 years ago, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. Cancer does run in my family, and I take it as it's just a uh, silent, deadly killer. I have a very personal attachment to breast cancer because I actually lost my mom and she was very young. She was only 48 years old. I really hope that Susan G. Coleman will find the cure for breast cancer and we can help to find a cure for breast cancer. Right? can go to Komen.org slash WWE to learn how to join the fight against breast cancer. Hashtag rise above cancer. I personally wanted to thank you for your support. Of this. The fan base is just as loud as the superstars and they realize how good this relationship can be. The WWE is continuing to do great things. On Monday Night Raw, John Cena and the WWE Universe presented a check on behalf of the WWE to the Susan G. Coleman Foundation for the amount of $1 million. And also, the WWE is continuing to spread the word about breast cancer. Now, if that don't tell you anything about what the WWE is con continuing to do outside of the sport, I don't know what is. I mean, you know, they, they do the Make-A-Wish Foundation. They also does Habitat for Humanity. They do Be a Star campaign. And an enormous a lot of other things out there that we're unaware of, of what they do. Vince McMahon has done marvelous work outside in the communities of cities across this great land, which we call the United States of America. And that speaks in high volumes. The NFL is also doing great things. Not taking nothing away from any other sport out there and just solely just saying what the WWE is doing. The NFL has raised... One million dollars to relief efforts of Hurricane Sandy. You know, when you think about what these athletes do from an entertainment level, such as the WWE, to the professional level, what you're talking about, the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, Major League Soccer, all these sports, the NHL, National Hockey League, and abroad, these organizations do a lot of great things to help a lot of people that are in need, and that are suffering. And I think that that is a great, noble cause that they do what they do. And should be commended and respected for that. Unlike you and I, we don't, to some degree, we don't have that capability, even though we would like to make a difference. But sometimes we feel as though, you know, well, what can I do? It's, you know, I, I don't have money like that or I don't have power like that or, you know, 
high character of praise from one constituent to another in the profession or the job that I'm in. But you can. You can do a lot more than you ever can imagine you possibly could if you just go ahead and just do it. If you want to give to the Susan G. Coleman Foundation, the website is right there on the screen. Make a donation to help save a life. Any amount that you give will make all the difference in the world. And also, post it up on the screen. If you want to give to the situation that happened with Hurricane Sandy, go ahead. I'm telling you, it will be well worth it. You can sleep better at night knowing that you gave what you could to help someone because you never know what individual that you've touched by making that donation to. We'll be right back after this. Well, that's all we have for today's show. I would like to thank my sponsors here in the West Michigan area for making this show a success. Thank you very much. Also, I would like to send another thank you out to Tally's Market. Tally's Market, everything you need for parties and occasions all up under one roof. Thanks a lot, Happy. Also, I would like to give a very special thank you to you, the listener, for tuning in because without you, this show could not be possible. If you'd like to send any comments or emails or things of that nature, my information is right there on the screen. Feel free. I'd like to hear from you. Let me know how the show is doing. Let me know if the show is doing great. Let me know if the show is not doing so great. And once again, I would like to thank you for tuning into The Scoop. We're right here. We bring The Scoop, the whole scoop, and nothing but The Scoop. I'm Sean Harris. Take care, and I'll see you next time.